Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named From Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The story picks up right where the first season left off with a radio tower built by the joint efforts of the townspeople who plan to use it to communicate with the outside world for rescue. But unfortunately, a sudden storm has devastated their efforts and the townspeople can only recover from the damage. The occasional sparks of electricity have thrown the colony house into chaos. Many residents believe this is a punishment from the monsters. The man who happened to be trapped in the secluded town, Jim, is incredibly frustrated. Though he managed to connect the radio, the information coming from the other end is rather peculiar. The voice knows Jim's name, and it even warns him that his wife shouldn't be digging in the basement. Jim shakes off the ominous feeling and is about to go inside when he sees a tour bus driving into town. So he rushes inside to announce this. The atmosphere becomes tense. Donna, the owner of the colony house, regains her composure and finds the deputy sheriff, Kenny, advising him that now that the sheriff is not here, he must shoulder the responsibility and save the bus passengers who have ventured into town, or they certainly won't survive the night. On the bus, a passenger named Elgin suddenly wakes from a nightmare. As if he's had a premonition, he yells for the driver to stop. The bus driver remains calm, explaining they've only taken a wrong turn and will be back on track soon, so there's no need for alarm. But as Elgin becomes more agitated, she reluctantly pulls over at the diner. The passengers, weary from a day's journey, are relieved to stretch their legs. Soon, the heavy rain stops. With the help of the medical girl, Mari, the agitated Elgin gradually calms down. When asked why he was so agitated, the man admits he had a terrifying dream, but doesn't elaborate on the details. By now, some townspeople have approached, advising the tourists to spend the night in the diner. But the bus driver asserts that they plan to leave town as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Jim has returned home to check on his wife's digging progress, only to find the hole blocked by collapsed debris. He got a bad feeling, as if the warning from the radio had come true. His wife, Tabitha, had been determined to uncover the town's power source secret by digging to see where the electrical wires led. She unexpectedly fell into a tunnel due to a collapse. It was there she discovered the underground wires were actually disconnected. Suddenly, the mysterious man, Victor, appeared and informed her that this was a lair for the monsters. They had to leave right away. Looking at the pitch-black tunnel, Tabitha shivered. Victor repeatedly whispered not to make any noise. If they wake the monsters, it's all over. He was led here through a tree hole by a little boy in white, specifically to rescue Tabitha. Suddenly, a suitcase on the ground caught her attention. Upon opening it, she found a woman's nightgown. Tabitha couldn't comprehend why such an item would be in the tunnel, but she swallowed her curiosity and continued to follow Victor. The dark tunnel felt like the mouth of a beast preparing to devour their parts. Tabitha had the nagging feeling something was watching her, but soon both were shocked to find they had entered a clearing filled with old furniture with several desiccated corpses propped up nearby. When a creepy doll appeared, Victor seemed triggered, trembling, and the doll had clearly stirred his painful memories. This time, it was Tabitha's turn to comfort him, using words, but not muscles. She then pulled him along to continue searching for an exit. Before long, a towering pile of stones came into view. As they stared in wonder, a sphere rolled out from a nearby cave, destroying the stone pile. Intrigued, Tabitha shone her flashlight towards the cave, catching a fleeting glimpse of a skinny figure. Then, to their horror, the corpses on the ground began to move. Victor shouted that they were waking up. Tabitha was terrified and suddenly felt a large puddle beneath her feet. In sync, they crawled following the direction of the water flow, finally finding the cave entrance and escaping from the hellish tunnel. However, Tabitha's husband, Jim, was unaware that his wife had escaped. He was trying to clear the debris blocking the hole. Their daughter, Julie, rushed home and realized what was happening when she saw her father's efforts. Jim reassured her and told her they needed help from others. So Julie ran to where the tourists were resting, pleading for them to rescue her trapped mother. Despite the bus driver trying to stop her, two young tourists decided to lend a hand. Just then, Donna and Kenny arrived at the scene. They didn't immediately inform about the impending crisis. Instead, they opened the doors of the diner and invited the tourists to have a cup of tea and rest. Donna took the opportunity to tell the bus driver about the monsters that appear in the town at night. However, the driver dismissed Donna as a greedy businesswoman. 
At this moment, Elgin, supported by Mari, decided to step out of the bus for some fresh air. Suddenly, he began to convulse on the ground. The deputy sheriff, Kenny, rushed to his aid, but he was anxious and didn't know what to do. Jim, who was working hard to rescue his wife, finally got some help. One of them was the town's bartender, and the others were the helpful tourists. The group reassured him that they would quickly clear the hole, but they had to endure the falling debris while laboriously clearing the rubble. Seeing the collapse getting worse, they had to stop their work and plan to retreat for rest. Unexpectedly, the house shook violently. Kenny and the others in the diner watched as Jim's house rapidly collapsed. A piece of wood blocked Jim's body, but it seemed he was not in life-threatening danger. Faint cries for help could be heard from the roof, and outside, the anxious Julie finally heard her father's response. Now, everyone needed to clear the debris and rescue Jim and the others. Before long, one of the tourists was freed. Unfortunately, the remaining survivors were all trapped at the bottom, and rescue wouldn't be simple. The town's doctor, Christy, examined the freed survivor and confirmed he was largely unharmed. Meanwhile, Mari from the bus finally saw the convulsing man return to normal. After that, Mari and Christy looked at each other, their faces brimming with excitement. It turned out that the two were former lovers, but since Christy came here, they had not seen each other. No one expected a reunion in this place. The bus driver suggested that it was time to leave the town. Seeing the sun about to set, Jim, who was still trapped under the debris and knew the horrors of the town, urged them to go home early. But Julie wouldn't agree. If her father wasn't rescued, he would surely be killed by the night monsters. But Donna was resolute, instructing Julie to cover her father with a rainproof cloth, which might help him evade the monster's attack. Then, Donna approached the tourists again, solemnly warning them that they couldn't leave the town. If they were still out when it got dark, they would surely be killed by the monsters. But the crowd couldn't accept her smelly bullshit. Frustrated, Donna ran back to her vehicle, pulled out a shotgun, and blew out the bus tires. Some tourists were frightened and fled. Kenny then pulled out his gun, forcefully herding the tourists into the diner. By the time they had sorted everything out, it was already getting dark. Kenny approached Julie, who had just finished covering her father with the rainproof cloth, and brought her into the diner as well. Meanwhile, the town's sheriff, Boyd, was trapped in a tight space, helplessly looking at the unreachable exit. Earlier, in search of a way to leave the town, he decided to trek through the forest behind the mountain. Just as he found a high tower, a sudden rainstorm came. The mysterious boy in white appeared out of nowhere, guiding him to take shelter in a tree hollow. However, as soon as Boyd crawled in, the surroundings suddenly changed. He found himself in a bottomless well. After yelling for a long time with no response, he tried to climb up, but the walls offered no support. Boyd was trapped and fell into despair. After a long time, he heard a weak voice from above the well. Boyd recognized the voice, which was asking if he was a human. Angrily, he yelled back to confirm its question. Unexpectedly, a rope slid down the well. Boyd knew that the person above intended to rescue him. He quickly climbed up the rope. This was his only chance to escape. After using all his strength, Boyd finally emerged from the well. He quickly pulled out his gun in fear. The owner of the voice turned out to be a skinny old man, his arms chained. It was a mystery how he had managed to lower the rope. As night fell, Kenny closed the main gate. The tourists became more restless. The bus driver took charge, warning everyone that it wasn't too late to let them all go. But Donna brandished her shotgun, gesturing for everyone to stay put. She then explained once more, saying that ever since they saw that fallen tree, they couldn't leave this place anymore. The tourists couldn't help but ask how she got to know about their encounter. Donna responded that all of them in the town had seen that tree. Her ominous warning managed to calm most of the tourists. However, a tourist intended to go out and take a look. Kenny immediately stopped him because his stupidity would get them all killed. But the tourist pulled out Kenny's gun, insisting that they all go outside together. Donna was filled with anger, but the tourists had not seen any signs of danger and signaled Donna to put down her weapon or else he would start shooting. Donna, however, said that even if he killed the deputy, she wouldn't put down her gun. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Kenny seized the opportunity to snatch his gun back. At this moment, everyone heard the harrowing screams coming from outside on the streets, showing that the demonic massacre had finally begun. Some tourists had broken away from the main group during the day, unaware of the horrors that nightfall brought. The town's resident, Fatima, wanted to warn them, but suddenly, two figures appeared from around the corner. Her boyfriend, Ellis, desperately pulled her into a room. The two figures outside the door flexed their eerie smiles, murmuring, Open the door! They were the legendary demons. Fatima was anxious, standing by the window and loudly warning the tourists to run. 
but they seemed oblivious, even shaking hands with the smiling demons. Ellis kept advising her to be rational, but her hatred for the demons reached its peak. If it wasn't for them, how could the townspeople's lives be so miserable? A young tourist couple were lucky because they had entered the town's bar, which had a talisman hanging by the door, so they didn't need to worry about demons coming in. Unfortunately, they didn't know about the taboo. Hearing the cries outside, they were discussing whether to open the door and help. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Hearing the person claiming to be from the tourist bus, the man didn't hesitate to open the door. On the other side, a demon with a smiling face approached the tour bus. After a moment of hesitation, it opened the door and stepped inside. As the interior lights flickered on, a few shadows flashed and vanished. The demon discovered living people hidden behind the seats. It rose slowly with a frozen smile, passed across rows of seats, and finally found two elderly persons hiding. In the next moment, the demon showed its true face. The occasional harrowing screams that echoed through the streets made Julie panicked because her father was still trapped beneath the rubble, likely at the mercy of the demon. Kenny tried to calm her that they had to stay put and learn to be strong and patient. Meanwhile, Jim and a few others were in a huge predicament. This wasn't exactly a sealed space, and without the protection of a talisman, they had to maintain absolute silence. Unexpectedly, one unconscious tourist woke up. He was unaware of the terror of the demon. Realizing he was trapped beneath the debris, he began to shout in fear. The bartender who was closest to him kept urging him not to make a sound, but the heavy objects pressing down on him made it hard for him to breathe. Suddenly, he couldn't help but cough a few times, and a pool of blood flowed out. The tourist became even more nervous. His groans of pain were particularly jarring in the night. In the next moment, a demon pounced on the man, while Jim, tucked away in the corner, felt desperate. Meanwhile, in the nearby diner, everyone heard it all too clearly. Julie erupted her anxiety again. She had to save her father no matter what. Donna used all her strength to block her at the door. Julie could only collapse helplessly on the ground and burst into sobs. On the other side, Boyd managed to climb out of the dried will using a rope, only to discover that his rescuer was a gaunt old man. Boyd was taken aback, looking around nervously, trying to figure out where he was. He was shocked to find several long-dead corpses affixed to the surrounding walls. Only the old man before him was still clinging to life, yet he had lost the will to live. He explained that after crawling into a tree hole, he had ended up in a demon's den. He had been hanging there, living a life worse than death, for ten years. The old man only wished that Boyd would end his misery with a gunshot, but Boyd wanted to save him. He then pulled out a talisman and threw it at the chains. Suddenly, pleasing music started playing from outside. The old man urged Boyd to leave quickly because he knew the demons would appear before the music stopped. Boyd discovered that the sound came from a music box, but had no idea how it started playing. Regardless, he was determined to save the old man. Just as he managed to break a chain, the music in the distance was nearing its end. The old man felt a severe pain coursing through his body and couldn't help but double over. Boyd hurriedly came forward to support him, only to see countless protrusions moving under the skin of the man's arm. Suddenly, the old man acted like a different person, swinging his arm and grabbing Boyd's shoulder. Boyd used all his strength to push him away, only to find that the old man had stopped breathing. He had to pick up a torch and shakily walk out of the stone chamber. To his surprise, he found himself still in the forest. Under the cover of the night, he couldn't even distinguish between east and west, let alone find his way back to the town. Just then, a hunting dog appeared out of nowhere and jumped in front of Boyd, as if to lead him on his way. Sadly, the dog disappeared not far from the starting point. Boyd quickly extinguished the torch in his hand and curled up behind a large tree. A few demons were walking towards him from the depths of the woods. Boyd panicked as beads of sweat dripped from his forehead. Perhaps due to the talisman, the group of demons did not notice his presence. On the other side, Victor and Tabitha had also just escaped from the demon's lair. Seeing that they couldn't make it back to the town before dark, Victor was surprisingly calm. After traversing a distance with Tabitha, they arrived at an abandoned truck. He opened the cargo door and the two quickly climbed in. To their surprise, this was one of Victor's hideouts. There was electric lighting inside and also some expired foods. Victor advised Tabitha that as long as they stayed quiet inside, they shouldn't attract the terrifying demons. Tabitha was puzzled and asked him why he had these supplies in the wilderness. Victor told her that his mother had brought him to this place when he was young, and over time he stored a lot of supplies here. While they were talking, there were footsteps outside, and then the door was pushed open. It was Boyd who had fled here, and he had a talisman with him. It seemed they could have a worry-free night. 
Suddenly, a figure in the distance was shouting for help. The man was being followed by several demons. They beckoned for the man to hurry in and managed to close the truck door before the demons caught up. Elgin, who had a lucky escape, turned out to be from the tour bus visiting the town. He had previously had a premonition and forced the bus to stop, saving everyone. After realizing that Elgin meant no harm, everyone began to keep themselves busy. Boyd bandaged the wounds caused by the strange old man, while Victor started to doodle. He said he often saw strange things in his dreams, and hence recorded them to prevent them from being forgotten. To the amazement of Boyd and Tabitha, the content of the drawings had all become reality. Later, a ray of sunlight shone in through the door gap. Dawn had finally arrived. The radio in the diner sounded once again. The passengers who had been up all night were inevitably a bit worn out. Seeing the terrifying night was finally over, Julie bolted out of the diner at top speed and was beside the rubble where her father lay in no time. She called out her dad with hope. Jim, who was under the rubble, seemed to sense her call and responded with difficulty, opening his eyes. Donna quickly called everyone to clear the debris. Only a few noticed the mutilated corpse lying on the ground. The bus driver returned to the bus, only to see the glaring blood stains and the scattered bodies of two elderly people in the back row. On the other side, Tabitha, who had just left the truck, learned from Elgin that the house next to the diner had collapsed. She realized that it was her house and ran towards the town as fast as she could. Boyd was just about to follow her when he saw several bumps moving under his skin. He was horrified, thinking that he might had he been infected after being scratched by the old man. Sometime later, Boyd finally returned safely to the town. The moving bumps on his arm had mysteriously disappeared. However, his experiences over the past few days were too bizarre. Even his own son Ellis found it hard to accept. How could one enter a tree hole and instantly teleport to another place? And what about Sarah, the girl who had been following him? Boyd stuttered, not knowing how to explain. Ellis suddenly became emotionally charged. His father asked what was wrong. Ellis then realized that he had lost his composure because of the demonic massacre the previous night. His girlfriend Fatima was on the verge of emotional collapse. Now hearing that his father had not found any clues to leave the town, he couldn't help but feel anxious and angry. Boyd wisely reminded his son to propose to his girlfriend to become the hope in her heart. Ellis had an epiphany and said that he would go to the forest to pick some wildflowers for his bride-to-be. The passengers outside the diner, despite the demonic event of the previous night, hadn't curbed their self-righteous behavior. Some insisted on carrying guns for self-defense. Donna strongly opposed this, as it could incite panic among the other residents. As the two were arguing, Boyd arrived to defuse the situation, declaring that no one was allowed to carry firearms within the town, a rule he set as the town's sheriff. If anyone didn't want to comply, he suggested they spend the night in the forest outside the town. The passenger, Randall, finally threw down his gun and retreated back into the crowd. Donna arranged for the group of passengers to stay temporarily in the colony house. Then she started complaining about the situation to Boyd. The previous heavy rain had destroyed half of the crops, and the remaining supplies had to be reduced, and there were 25 passengers in total. Apart from the dozen or so people living in the diner, there were still three missing, and their bodies hadn't been found. After venting her grievances, Donna asked Boyd what he had experienced in the forest. Boyd just looked at her but didn't say anything, because he knew he couldn't voice his concerns and add to the worries. The only person Boyd could confide in was his wife, Abby, who had passed away many years ago. He was so surprised that the old man he encountered earlier somehow knew his wife's name. Ellis was picking wildflowers for his girlfriend in the forest. Kenny happened to pass by to check the animal traps, but he couldn't find the iron rod that was supposed to prop up the traps. Suddenly, a faint singing voice came from afar. The two of them quickly ran over, only to find a girl with an iron rod sticking out of her head, a phone in front of her playing music. They were debating whether or not to carry the body back to town when the girl suddenly took a breath. Unexpectedly, she was still alive. Kenny ran back to seek help, while Ellis stayed to take care of the injured girl. It turns out that last night, while hiding in the bar with her boyfriend, someone knocked on the door. To their horror, it was a smiling demon. The demon dragged the girl and her boyfriend into the forest for what it called a fun game. When she woke up, she was in her current state. Soon after, Kenny arrived with the town doctor. Christy examined the girl and found that the iron rod had gone straight through her head, with the end fixed in the tree trunk. Christy was astonished by that, and she told her two companions that the girl was beyond saving. Her survival up to this point was a miracle. The only thing they could do was end her pain sooner. The girl seemed to sense her impending death, and tears rolled down her cheeks. 
Christy was frank to her, asking her if she had any last wishes. The girl said she wanted to call her mother. Christy regretfully informed her that there was no signal here and they couldn't use a mobile phone. Amid her disappointment, she heard a faint calling. The next moment, she felt a sharp pain in her forehead. Just as everyone was at a loss, Boyd came to check the situation. He walked over to the girl, gripping the rod. The moment Boyd pulled it out, her screams stopped abruptly. Her death gave a considerable shock to the people present, but the sin and burden were borne alone by Boyd. Later, he found Donna and told her that when he was fighting abroad, the vehicle he was in was hit by a missile. His best friend was blasted to half his body, and his name was the same as the girl and her boyfriend. Because of the coincidence, Boyd began to suspect that the town must be an illusion. Donna noticed Boyd's abnormality and asked what he had experienced in the forest. Seeing that Boyd was still unwilling to reveal, all she could do was to encourage him to pull himself together because the townspeople couldn't lose hope, Boyd promised her. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Jim was finally rescued from the pit. However, he had broken two ribs. Christy warned him to stop causing trouble and lie down to recover. But after sending his children out of the room, Jim eagerly asked his wife about what she had discovered in the basement. Tabitha did not dare to tell him about the demon's lair she had found. Instead, she said that the wire in the basement was actually disconnected, and she had no idea where the town's electricity was coming from. As soon as Tabitha left, Jim struggled to get up, wanting to check why the sign at the door was still lit. Just as he was climbing onto the stool, he bumped into a volunteer who had come to help at the clinic. After learning that the volunteer had been trapped in the town with the bus yesterday, Jim's curiosity was piqued, and he began asking many questions. He then discovered that Christy and Mari before him were a couple. This information made Jade fall into deep thought. As Tabitha and her daughter were packing up their clothes to go home, Tabitha suddenly stopped. She saw two pale-faced children staring at her, but her daughter Julie saw nothing. Tabitha panicked and pulled her daughter away from the scene. Upon returning home, she saw her young son playing with blocks at the door. At first, she didn't notice anything strange, but when the blocks took shape, Tabitha was stunned. The structure her son had built was exactly the same as the millstone in the underground cave. The two strange boys she had encountered earlier also reappeared. Without giving it much thought, she quickly pulled her son back into the room. Meanwhile, Victor returned home to find his room ransacked as if it had been plundered. Even his beloved violin was missing. Luckily, the woman next door told him that Jade had been there the night before. Victor ran downstairs and sure enough, he heard the sound of a violin from Jade's room. He angrily took back the toy that had been with him throughout his childhood, reprimanding Jade for taking his things without permission. Seeing Victor leave in anger, Jade chased after him to explain. Jade often saw strange illusions, especially those odd circular symbols. He had seen many similar symbols in an old notebook interspersed with a blurred photograph. The photo's background was a young Victor, which made him wonder what secrets Victor's home held. Perhaps they could find clues to escape the town. Victor stared at the old photo for a long time, then told him that he shouldn't have touched this before leaving. Elgin, the bus passenger who had just settled into the colony house, cautiously asked Fatima if there were any lakes or rivers nearby. Somewhat puzzled, she took him to a lake in the back mountain and asked how he knew about the lake since he had only arrived in town a few days ago. Elgin claimed he saw it in a dream. Fatima wasn't surprised at all since many residents in the town had similar experiences, but they hadn't figured out the cause yet. The most typical case was the town girl Sarah, who could even communicate with mysterious entities. Meanwhile, Kenny returned to his old house and suddenly heard faint noises coming from the basement. Alarmed, he drew his pistol and descended the stairs, exploring around. In the dark corner, he saw a figure. It was Sarah, whom was supposed to team with Boyd to seek rescue previously. Kenny immediately reported the matter to Boyd, who was shocked and rushed to the basement of the church where Sarah was, his mind full of questions. Boyd held back his words and sent his deputy away. There were too many secrets between him and Sarah. He was curious to know where Sarah had gone after he had entered the tree hole. To his surprise, Sarah stated that after she entered the tree hole, she was directly teleported here. Although surprised, Boyd didn't doubt her because the strange old man had said that the tree hole could teleport people to random locations. Boyd considered himself lucky to have ended up at the dry well while the old man was teleported straight into the monster's lair. Boyd then asked her how she knew the tree hole could teleport people. Sarah said a little boy in white told her. Boyd thought of Sarah's ability to communicate with demons and wondered if the boy in white might also be a demon. However, Sarah denied it, believing the boy was different. He was also trapped in the town. 
Boyd decided to first solve the problem at hand. In the eyes of the townspeople, Sarah was a vicious murderer. Boyd first sought out his deputy, Kenny, intending to reveal some information about her. Sarah had the ability to communicate with demons, and her previous killings were done under their influence. Despite the grave mistakes she had committed, she might be their only hope to escape this mysterious town. This was also why the now-deceased priest insisted on hiding her in the basement, sparing her from punishment. But Kenny still thought that Sarah should be punished for her killings. Seeing this, Boyd swallowed the words he was about to say. If he were to reveal that Kenny's father was also caused to death by Sarah, Kenny might become even more furious. He then suggested locking Sarah in a cage to die at the hands of a demon. Boyd was upset upon hearing that, but he suddenly felt dizzy and realized that his skin was starting to bulge and move again, causing him to stumble and fall to the ground. After a thorough check by Christy, no abnormalities were found. Christy knew that Boyd had a mild case of epilepsy and advised him not to put too much pressure on himself. If his condition worsened, he might start to have hallucinations. Boyd was just about to get up and leave, but quickly sat back down. It seemed there was indeed something wrong with him. Suddenly, there was a commotion in the hall. It turned out that Tabitha had come to visit her husband. Not seeing him on the bed, she asked Mari and found out that Jim had gone out for some air again. She felt her husband should not keep wandering around. However, Jim looked worried. During his recovery days, he had pieced together all the clues about the town and realized that the town is actually a damned experimental project. Jim had once been involved in a roller coaster construction project. The more unexpected elements there were, the stronger the passengers' reactions would be. And this town was full of surprises, broken power lines, the meeting of Christy and her partner Mari, etc. It was as if someone had deliberately designed it to watch everyone's reactions. What's more, just a few minutes before the storm, the voice over the radio knew Jim's name and even predicted that Tabitha digging a hole would lead to the house collapsing. It felt like everything was a prearranged script. Jim decided to share this discovery with Donna, as she had also heard the voice over the radio. But after hearing Jim's speculation, she immediately told him not to spread this around unless more truth was uncovered, because it would cause panic among residents, and it was hard to determine whether the person speaking over the radio was friend or foe. Jim thought this made sense, so he planned to connect the radio again to see if he could get more information. At this time, Jim's two children had also arrived at the colony house. The young boy, Ethan, went straight into the room of the strange man, Victor. He wanted to apologize to Victor that he shouldn't have brought Jade here, leading to Victor losing his beloved violin. Victor was still sulking on his own. Ethan had no choice but to put down the paintbrushes he had collected and quietly walk away. Julie had to follow her younger brother and leave. Suddenly, there was a commotion outside the hall. It was the bus passenger who had moved in, clashing with the old residents. Randall reprimanded the other for not to meddle with his stuff. Although his actions were justified, Donna was filled with anger. No fights or brawls were allowed in the colony house, and the image of the demon breaking in a few months ago was still vivid in her mind. She had to nip any potential threat in the bud and expel this troublemaker. Seeing that Randall was lying there unmoved, Donna swung her huge axe at him. This action scared him greatly. He hastily packed his backpack and fled from the colony house. Fortunately, Donna didn't send him straight to his death. Instead, she sent him to settle down in the bus. Looking at the blood stains on the floor, the man felt a little scared. Donna took out an amulet and reminded him never to take it off and not to open the door if he heard a knock. Seeing that he was scared like a chicken, Donna maliciously reminded him that the bus had no curtains and he would definitely see a different scenery at night. After closing the car door, she left without looking back. Meanwhile, the bus driver felt very guilty because all of the passengers taking her bus were trapped in this damned town. She had planned to submit her resignation last week, but kept delaying it and somehow ended up here. Jade, sitting nearby, raised his glass to assure her that they should work together to leave this town. On the other side, Boyd walked into the police station, only to see the deceased priest suddenly appear out of thin air. He kept telling himself that it must be a hallucination, but the priest was very much alive and asked Boyd how he planned to tell Kenny that it was Sarah who killed Kenny's father. But Boyd still preferred to protect Sarah because she could communicate with the demon. But the priest warned Boyd that Kenny might find out the truth one day and it would pose a great threat to the town's stability. He also urged Boyd to learn how to make choices as the town's sheriff. Unknown to him, Kenny had actively sought out Sarah. He needed to understand more to align his views with Boyd. Sarah admitted she had made many mistakes, and it was too late to turn back. 
Kenny said his mother treated her like her own daughter, and she doesn't want Sarah to be seen as a criminal by the residents. Hearing this, Sarah's guilt intensified, and she finally admitted that she was the one who opened the door on the night Kenny's father was killed by the demon. When Boyd arrived at the church, he was told that the deputy had gone to the clinic. At this time, Kenny was standing blankly in the place where his father was killed. He remembered when his father was first diagnosed with dementia, he suggested that his father stay in the clinic for better care. Despite his dad's insistence on going home, his mom forced him to stay. Little did they know that not long after, his father would be killed by a monster that suddenly broke in. Both Kenny and his mother fell into deep self-blame. After learning that Sarah was the one who let the demon in, Kenny was completely unsettled. He wanted Sarah to receive the punishment she deserved. Boyd tried to dissuade him, stating that he had known about this for a while, but there were reasons for not punishing Sarah. This made Kenny even more furious, and he angrily tore off his badge and stormed off. Later that night, Randall, sleeping in the bus, was on the brink of a breakdown. Outside, the bus was surrounded by monsters, waiting for their chance to pray. Though the talisman stones could prevent them from breaking in, he couldn't bear their menacing stares. He cussed non-stop inside the bus until dawn when the disgruntled demons finally withdrew. Also sleep-deprived was the eccentric Jade. He felt that some old photos communicated crucial information. Suddenly, the man in the photo appeared out of nowhere, holding a strange, blood-stained pattern. The sight gave Jade a start, but he soon realized it was just a hallucination. He was not satisfied and arranged all the bottles in the bar to mimic the pattern's outline, trying to understand its peculiarity. Suddenly, the bar door was pushed open. It was Victor who came seeking help. It turned out Victor wanted him to perform a song, but not in the bar. Jade couldn't fathom the request, but followed silently, curious to see what Victor was up to. Unconsciously, they passed through a forest. Jade was shocked at the sight of a large number of scrapped cars parked on an open ground. These were the cars that had accidentally entered the town earlier. But why had Victor moved them here? Victor led Jade to a red off-road vehicle. It was his mother's car. Whenever he was scared as a child, his mother would play a song for him. The recent bizarre incidents in the town reminded Victor of past experiences, and he felt panic rising again. He hoped that Jade could play that familiar tune like his mother. As the melodious notes filled the air, Victor closed his eyes. The gentle breeze felt like his mother's warm embrace, easing his anxiety. When the song ended, Victor started to fulfill his promise. He pointed out the man's name in the old photo and said that the red car was the man's vehicle. Initially, the man was a very cheerful person, loved by the townspeople, but after seeing the strange symbols on a page, his demeanor changed dramatically. He never smiled again. One day, Victor's mother hid him in a place unknown even to the man, looking panic-stricken. When he woke up the next day, all the people in the town had met untimely ends. Due to the trauma, Victor became paranoid. He firmly believed that a mysterious force in the town could change people's behavior and lead them to do bad things, and Sarah was one of the manipulated victims. At the moment, Jim and Tabitha stormed into the church, furious at Boyd's protection of her. They were infuriated because Sarah had not only killed several residents, but had also tried to harm their son, Ethan. Despite their anger, Boyd insisted that Sarah, who could communicate with demons, might be the key to understanding the town's mysterious happenings. He hoped she would be given a chance to reform. Sarah was filled with remorse, blaming her actions on being bewitched by the devil. Tabitha, however, was unwilling to hear any explanations and stormed off after throwing a harsh word. Sheriff Boyd realized the seriousness of the situation. He decided to consult Donna. Sarah left the church and went to her former residence. The living room setup was nearly the same, especially the jacket on the chair, which felt familiar. Suddenly, a strange man approached her, questioning why she intruded into his home. It turned out that during the time Sarah was gone, her house had been given to someone else. Sarah quickly explained that she just wanted to retrieve some important items, but the stranger informed her that all her personal belongings had been moved to the storage room at the diner. Feeling like an outcast, Sarah hurriedly left her former residence. On the other side, Boyd found Donna in the colony house. After he detailed Sarah's predicament, Donna said that anyone who committed wrongdoings should be put in a cage to face the demon, according to the rules set down by Boyd himself. They couldn't possibly break these rules for an elusive reason. Realizing that even Donna didn't support him, Boyd stormed off in a huff. Donna added that if they didn't punish Sarah, what would happen to those she had hurt? Indeed, since Ethan heard of Sarah's return, he had been hiding in his room, too scared to see anyone. As Jim and Tabitha were discussing what to do, Ethan 
Nathan suddenly opened his room door, expressing his wish to see Sarah. He remembered his mother's teaching that everyone must have the courage to face their fears, as that's the only way to strip the enemy of their power. These words greatly comforted Tabitha. Meanwhile, Sarah, who was hovering near the diner, was contemplating whether to go in when Jim and his son approached her. The fear in Ethan had disappeared. He solemnly told Sarah that they were once good friends, and even if she had become scarier than a monster, he was no longer afraid of her. Sarah didn't respond as she watched the young boy walk away. She turned her gaze back to the diner, but she didn't have the courage to face the diner owner who loved her like her own daughter. Upon returning to the church, Sarah happened to meet Elgin, who had just arrived in town and was idling about, unaware of the mistakes Sarah had made in the past. So he casually struck up a conversation with her. It had been a long time since Sarah had confided in anyone, and she started talking about her deceased brother. Back in the day, the two of them had relied on each other in this town, especially during Christmas. They would rack their brains to collect small gifts. Now, the thing Sarah wanted to do the most was to retrieve those items as keepsakes. Elgin encouraged her, saying that one should strive for the happiness they desire. His words finally gave Sarah the determination she needed, so she resolutely walked into the diner. As expected, the diner owner blamed Sarah for the death of her husband. After hurriedly moving a box of items, she declared that she never wanted to see Sarah again. Sarah did not try to explain herself. She picked up the box and left, the sound of shattering bowls echoing behind her. Just then, Kenny rushed over. He snatched the box from Sarah's hands, scattering all the items inside. Perhaps that wasn't enough to vent his anger, so he smashed a ceramic doll. These were the small gifts that Sarah's brother had painstakingly collected, and she had always treasured them. But facing the deputy sheriff's violence, she just kept apologizing. Then she scrambled to pick up the items. Meanwhile, Jim and his son had just returned home and were met by Tabitha, who had been waiting at the door for a long time. Upon learning that Ethan had confronted Sarah and completely banished his fears, she felt a wave of relief. Ever since she and Victor had escaped from the demon's lair, Tabitha had inexplicably seen pale-faced children, especially when she discovered her son playing with the same pile of stones from the cave, she felt a deep fear. Looking at the pile of stones placed at the door, Tabitha decided to no longer run away and placed a similar pile of stones at the exit of the demon's cave, hoping to summon those children and see what they wanted to do. Suddenly, slight panting sounds came from deep in the woods, and the children really appeared. Tabitha asked who they were, but they just kept approaching step by step, which scared Tabitha into curling up on the ground. Suddenly, all the surrounding noises disappeared, and she realized that the children were gone. Jade happened to pass by and saw Tabitha with a nosebleed. At the same time, her husband Jim found Sheriff Boyd. He told Boyd everything about the strange sounds coming from the walkie-talkie, hoping to join forces to confirm whether the town was indeed an experimental field. However, Boyd didn't immediately agree, but went straight to the owner of the diner. He apologized to her and explained his intention to protect Sarah, because he was more concerned with how to lead the residents out of the town. The owner's son, Kenny, stormed in before his mother could respond. He was furious at Boyd's protective actions. Boyd understood and excused himself. However, when he returned to the church, he found it empty, save for a music box playing a beautiful melody. However, the sight of a woman in white dancing with the music sent shivers down his spine. Boyd couldn't believe his eyes because the woman was his wife, Abby, who had been dead for many years. He was also familiar with the music box. When he saw the strange old man, the box was in the room. At that time, the old man said it was the demon's favorite toy, and they would appear as soon as the music stopped. Boyd was completely immersed in his wife's beautiful dance, but in the next moment, his wife turned into a hideous demon. Everything that had just happened was merely his hallucination. He had not left the diner. For safety reasons, Kenny decided to accompany Boyd. He was curious why all the leaves had fallen for no reason. Boyd didn't pay attention to these because his arm skin started to wriggle again. But when Kenny came close, nothing happened. Boyd didn't know how to explain. Then he heard the familiar melody again, and the music box reappeared. The surprised Boyd slowly approached it. Suddenly, the cellar door was pushed open, and his wife in white walked out. Seeing her cold eyes, Boyd stood there without speaking. Kenny reminded him, making him realize what had just happened was another hallucination because Kenny didn't see anything. Boyd didn't want to explain further and left in a daze. Later, he revealed his fear to the town's doctor, Christy. He felt that there must be something in his body. The old man had touched his bleeding wound and said they shared the same blood. 
Coupled with the frequent hallucinations recently, Boyd was sure that the evil power hidden in his body was reawakening. Boyd's worsening hallucinations made Kenny less angry with him because his father was an Alzheimer's patient. As the two were talking, Boyd in his room felt a sudden pain in his arm. That eerie music box had appeared again. Suddenly, a familiar silhouette was projected on the curtain next to the sickbed. Boyd couldn't help but rise to his feet and threw back the curtain. To his surprise, his wife embraced him from behind. As she was about to choke him, Boyd pushed her heavy body away and quickly drew his gun. Just then, Mari walked into the room, which startled the intruder. Boyd apologized and then retreated to the corner of the adjoining hospital room, where there was a pool of blood left behind from Kenny's father's death. Suddenly, the figure of the priest appeared behind him. Boyd was not surprised. He knew this was his subconscious self. The other self told him that everyone thought he was crazy. Boyd did not deny it, but he was sure he was sane. It was just that his blood had been corrupted. Just then, Kenny walked in and saw Boyd talking to himself. He chided him with frustration, reminding him that he was the pillar of the whole town. Boyd was also upset, saying that he was almost scared to death. Meanwhile, Donna was worried about the food for the residents. A sudden storm had destroyed the crops, and all the food in the town was now only a few baskets. She had to find a way to help the residents survive until the next harvest. So Donna called the diner owner to Jim's house, and they pickled the remaining vegetables. This could preserve them for longer. Jim, on the other hand, was worried about another problem. The food shortage might cause greater panic among the residents. Perhaps the experimenters behind the scenes were increasing the test level. They loved to stir up fear among the residents. Donna asked if he had a better solution. Then she went into the basement alone, but Ethan followed her. The boy said he had a secret for Donna. He wasn't as strong as his parents thought. He was worried about the arrival of the demon every night. Donna told him that people are different from demons because humans have a range of emotions like happiness, joy, and fear. And fear often brings out great courage. However, the people in the colony house did not turn their fear into courage. When they found their meal portions decreasing, someone protested that there was not enough food left, why they had to take in so many newcomers. When Ellis tried to mediate the situation, he met with disaster. One of the protesters stabbed him in the lung. A large amount of blood gushed out. Fatima was immediately anxious at her dying boyfriend. They had to get him to the clinic as soon as possible, but Ellis refused, saying it was nighttime and they couldn't go out of the colony house. Fatima couldn't care less about that. Perhaps they could try driving away to the town's clinic. The newcomer, Elgin, volunteered with determination. He was willing to accompany Fatima on her journey. The guard at the gate told everyone that there was a demon not too far ahead. Elgin took a deep breath, asking Fatima to wait at the door while he rushed out alone. There was a distance between the place where the car was parked and the colony house. When Elgin jumped into the car, demons from all directions had already started to gather. He stepped on the gas and parked the car next to the steps. Fatima then helped her boyfriend get into the car. Elgin started the car immediately, not daring to delay, as the demons were fast approaching. In the pitch-dark night, the roars of demons echoed from time to time. Fatima comforted her boyfriend. They finally reached the town clinic without major incidents. Hearing the frantic knocking on the door, the town's doctor, Christy, first peeked out, then hurriedly opened the door. Boyd from the next room rushed over. On seeing his son covered in blood, he was so shocked that he couldn't speak. Christy used an injection to drain the blood and air that were squeezing Ellis's lungs, temporarily saving his life. But he had lost too much blood earlier and needed a blood transfusion immediately. The only person who could provide the matching blood type was Boyd, Ellis's father. However, when Boyd rolled up his sleeves, he suddenly stopped. His blood contained evil worms, which he absolutely could not pass on to Ellis. Everyone thought Boyd had lost his mind. Kenny drew his gun, arguing that it was better than letting Ellis die outright. Boyd wanted to say more, but his arms started hurting again. This time, everyone finally saw the worms wriggling under his skin. Everything Boyd had been saying was true. Kenny took out a dagger, suggesting that Boyd give him the worms. Then he would use clean blood for Ellis's transfusion. Boyd, however, rejected his kindness because only he knew how painful it was to be afflicted by these worms. Then, an idea struck him. He walked straight to the front door. If he couldn't pass the worms to his own people, he could surely pass them to the demons outside. So Boyd pushed open the door and started shouting into the quiet night. 
Soon, demons began to appear to flex their fake smiles. They seemed to be trying to provoke Boyd's fear and did not attack immediately. Boyd suppressed his fear and took out a dagger to cut his palm. He then swiped at one of the monsters, but the monster's wound didn't bleed and its smile intensified. Without thinking, Boyd pressed his bleeding palm against the demon's wound. Immediately, he felt something surge into the demon's body. In the next moment, the demon let out a shrill scream, revealing its true form and writhing on the ground. The other demons were attracted by its condition and gathered around. Boyd took this opportunity to escape back to the clinic. He was certain that his blood was now completely safe. After a major blood transfusion, Ellis finally passed the critical period. Boyd and Kenny stood at the door, looking at the fallen demon outside. It turned out that demons could be killed. Boyd decided to perform a dissection first thing in the morning to see what this creature was. The next morning, the demon's body was still lying motionless on the ground. Boyd and the others slowly approached. It seemed that it was indeed dead. Christie shared Boyd's thoughts that a dissection should be performed to find out what this creature was. Kenny, however, felt like chickening out, who knew what dangers the dissection could bring. Boyd ignored his concerns, told his son to go back as soon as possible, otherwise many people would come to check on his injuries. It was better that as few people as possible knew about the dissection of the demon. After Ellis left with his girlfriend and Elgin, they found a white cloth and lifted the demon's body into the clinic's operating room. Kenny reluctantly followed. Boyd instructed him to go to the warehouse to find some tools for dissection, but he still had some concerns. The worms in Boyd's body had passed into the demon's body. Were they still alive now? Mari suddenly ran out of the room, coughing. Christy knew that her girlfriend was having withdrawal symptoms. After settling her down, Christy and Boyd went to the operating room. After everything was ready, Christy put on gloves and undressed the demon. Just as she was about to make the incision, the demon suddenly twitched, giving everyone a jump scare. Christy explained that it was a reflex, but Kenny couldn't take it anymore and ran out of the clinic. Christy quickly followed and asked him why he was so cowardly. Kenny explained that he was not afraid of the monster, but worried about the worms that had burrowed into its body. What if they came out again? Christy was willing to take the risk. The worms were like poison, dissolved into the demon's blood. If they could extract it, it would be a weapon against the demons. But Kenny expressed that he was worried about her safety. Christy didn't respond and just turned and left. At this time, Mari, who had been lying in bed, suddenly stood up. She found that everyone in the room was gone. When she pushed open the doors to the operating room, the demon's body had strangely vanished without a trace. Upon hearing her cry for help, Boyd rushed over and saw another demon slowly approaching. He raised his gun and fired. Mari, however, turned her attention to a music box that had appeared out of nowhere. It turned out that everything had just been a dream. Meanwhile, Christy and Boyd had already begun the autopsy. They managed to pry open the demon's chest. Christy was shocked as she looked at the organs inside. They were clearly human in structure, only completely dehydrated due to lack of water. This revelation sent Boyd into a panic. If there was no blood, where had the worms gone? Christy too began to get impatient. In her frustration, she began to stab the body. Boyd suddenly yelled at her to stop when he saw a yellow bile seeping out. This could potentially be the poison needed to combat the demons. They quickly collected the bile in a glass bottle. Having completed their task, Christy only wanted to rest with her girlfriend. But for Boyd, this was only the first step of a long journey. He needed to test the effectiveness of the yellow bile on a demon. Kenny mentioned that this was yet another risky move, but he pledged his full support. On the other side of town, after Jim's family had finished pickling their food, their son Ethan wanted to go to the colony house to find Victor. But Jim voiced his objection, but Tabitha had a different thought. Jim then called his wife outside, saying that Victor would definitely lead their child astray. But Tabitha didn't agree, because if it weren't for Victor, she might have died in the demon's cave. Jim brought up the lab theory again. What if the cave was simply a tool used by the puppeteer to instill fear? Tabitha thought her husband was obsessing over this theory. She retorted asking how he knew the intentions behind the voice on the walkie-talkie were good or bad. After speaking, she angrily stormed back into the room. Jim stood there, lost in thought. Suddenly, a drone appeared from the distance. It belonged to Randall, who lived in the bus. He had been banished from the colony house by Donna because he repeatedly broke the rules. But Jim saw him in a different light. After all, he was the first one to rush in and help when his wife was trapped in the underground cave. 
Randall explained that the drone was originally meant to be a birthday gift for his nephew, but it was of no use now. Jim believed the drone could help everyone escape the town. Thus, he led Randall to the side of the road where a caravan had overturned. This was the vehicle that Jim had used to enter the town. The two found an antenna inside. Jim wanted to use Randall's drone to send the antenna to the highest point and re-establish contact with the mysterious person via radio. Randall thought it made some sense. However, he also proposed a doubt. To maintain such a large-scale experiment, the puppeteer must have someone on the inside to keep the experiment on track. The question was, who could that be? Meanwhile, Ethan followed his sister to the colony house to find Victor, who was busy measuring the shift in position of a large tree. Perhaps he was the only one in the whole town who noticed these insignificant details. Victor reported that the leaves on the tree were withering, something that had never happened before. Any changes in the town usually signified that something bad was about to happen. On the other side, Tabitha found Jade and asked him why he wasn't surprised at those strange phenomena. Jade's answer was unexpected. He was already accustomed to strange things and didn't find anything in this town surprising. He then went on to recount all the odd occurrences he had encountered. Tabitha was full of questions. She had once lost a few months old baby, so she encountered a pale-faced child, indicating that this might be related to one's own experiences. Jade agreed with her, thinking it was possible. But when Tabitha was about to leave, she saw strange symbols in a notebook. She looked surprised, stating she had seen these symbols on the walls of the tunnel before. Back at the colony house, after settling her injured boyfriend, Fatima immediately sought out Donna. She shared with her that she was pregnant. However, before entering the town, doctors had clearly stated that she had a physical defect and couldn't become pregnant. She was afraid that something terrible might happen to her. Donna laughed after hearing this, instantly dispelling Fatima's worries. This town could make the impossible possible, from the never-ending road to the demons appearing at night. The strange things they had encountered so far only brought despair, but her strange experience was a joyful anomaly. It showed that they hadn't been abandoned by God. Later, Julie found Elgin. Elgin completely forgot Boyd's warning when he was with a pretty girl. He then shared the secret of the demon being killed and dissected the previous night. Julie thought this was a good thing. Maybe they could really find a way to deal with the demons. Elgin, however, felt that these scenes had occurred in his dreams before, and the ending was quite tragic. Julie advised him not to overthink, which was a common problem among the townsfolk. She then shared her own solution, which was to immerse her head in a bathtub. The sensation of water hitting her ears felt like a vacation by the sea, allowing her to forget all her troubles. Elgin took her words and immediately filled a bathtub with water back at the colony house. But when he submerged himself in the water, a music box appeared out of nowhere. Immediately, a pair of hands pushed Elgin into the water. All he could see was a terrifying, pale ghost face. Fortunately, when Sheriff Boyd arrived, Elgin was unharmed, albeit shaken. He claimed to have been awakened by someone, and what he experienced was just a dream. Still, when he woke up, he coughed up several mouthfuls of water. Boyd was shocked, but acted nonchalant. He took out the bile extracted from the demon's body, suggesting it might be the weapon to kill the demons. This reassured Elgin, and he suggested smearing it on bullets, like silver bullets used against vampires. Meanwhile, Kenny staying at home suddenly heard the telephone ringing. Both mother and son stared wide-eyed because the phone in the town was supposed to be disconnected and was merely a decorative item. Kenny slowly picked up the phone. The voice on the other end said, They're coming unless you stop. Just as Kenny hung up, the iron pot began to hum. Upon closer inspection, it was filled with flying insects. One even flew onto Kenny's arm. Thankfully, what he just experienced was a dream, but there was an apparent burn on his left arm, left by the insect from his dream. This was similar to Elgin's experience, indicating that the town might have started a new challenge mode where dream experiences can affect reality. Boyd, with a worried expression, found Kenny and learned about his dream-induced arm injury. He then shared Elgin's idea of making bile bullets. Kenny was quick to respond, saying they would need more bile. Subsequently, the two of them went to the clinic where the demon's body was stored. To their surprise, the two doctors were sitting on the sofa, shivering. Upon inquiry, they learned that strange noises often came from the room where the demon's body was kept. Boyd and Kenny silently approached the room. Upon opening the door, they saw the white cloth covering the body undulating. Boyd swiftly uncovered it, revealing the body covered in insects. Kenny turned pale. These insects had appeared in his dream. Even their humming was identical.
identical. Looking at the wound on his arm and thinking about Elgin's previous encounter, Mary couldn't explain why the dreams could cause injuries. She even dreamt of the demon suddenly awakening and snarling at her just yesterday. Everyone stood in silence when Donna suddenly barged in. Upon understanding the situation, she scolded Boyd for not reporting to her in time. Boyd admitted his mistake and immediately took her into the room where the body was kept. Surprisingly, all the insects that had been crawling all over the body were gone. Donna, however, didn't care and insisted that the body should be burnt immediately. Boyd also wanted to destroy the body as soon as possible in hopes that the terrifying dreams would disappear. After the fire was set ablaze, Kenny voiced his concern. What if the dreams don't go away? Perhaps we're running out of time. Meanwhile, Jim and Randall grouped together to uncover the town's secret in their own way. They connected an antenna to a drone, attempting to establish contact with the mysterious person via radio. In a sudden thought, Randall asked Jim if he had ever seen the demon kill with his own eyes. He stayed in the bus every night and had never witnessed such an event. Even on the first night they arrived in town when numerous residents were harmed, their bodies were never properly identified. Because of that, Randall suspected the demon's killings were someone's deliberate show. Jim found this hard to believe as he had seen Sarah kill her own brother. Randall, however, had his own theory. Sarah's killing could be due to her mental issues, or she was manipulated by someone. Soon after, the antenna connection was completed, but due to insufficient load capacity, the drone couldn't reach the desired height. Randall gave up on this plan. He was more inclined to investigate the mole among the residents. Jim told Randall that only three people in the town made the rules, Donna, Boyd, and the deceased priest. Randall immediately focused his suspicion on Donna, with whom he had a disagreement. The two men first went to find Sarah at the church, intending to ask about her past with her brother. Sarah looked panicked and resistant. Randall thought this was promising and decided to add more fuel to the fire. He then suggested that Sarah's brother might still be alive. Just then, Donna walked in carrying a box of clothes. Randall couldn't help but laugh, sarcastically commenting on Donna's perfect timing. She looked bewildered at first, asked Sarah to help mend the clothes, and then ushered both Jim and Randall out of the church. Sarah quickly asked Donna why they thought her brother was still alive, but Donna just took a deep breath and didn't answer. Upon leaving the church, Jim felt that they might have gone too far since they based everything on assumptions, but with no solid evidence. So he made a pact with Randall to sneak into the trailer at night to observe, hoping they might see something different. Of course, this plan was not without its risks. Jim would have to let his family know and bring a talisman to ward off demons. As they left the diner, they bumped into Donna, who asked what they were up to. Jim put on a troubled look and admitted that talking to Sarah was a mistake. He was just looking for answers. Donna felt satisfied, reminding him not to get too close to the hot-tempered Randall. On the other hand, Jade learned from Tabitha that she had also seen similar symbols in the cave. When they arrived near the cave entrance, Jade was extremely excited, thinking there must be a connection. However, when Tabitha mentioned that Victor had also seen the symbols in the cave, Jade was instantly furious. He had made a deal with Victor, and the reward was to reveal all the secrets about the symbols. He didn't expect Victor to choose to hide them. Meanwhile, Victor had found his only friend, Ethan, and planned to give him his childhood jacket as a compensation for neglecting their friendship. Ethan gladly accepted and took him to help at the diner. The young boy accidentally found a small toy in the pocket of the jacket. Seeing this, Victor became gloomy. Suddenly, Jade came to confront Victor about hiding the cave symbols, arguing that the townsfolk should share all information so that they could find a way home faster. To everyone's surprise, Victor declared that this town was his home. Tabitha thought Jade was being a bit too harsh, and she hurried off after Victor. Victor returned home clutching a small toy that Ethan had found. It turned out to be a memento left by his mother before she departed. Tragically, shortly after this, the entire town's inhabitants were brutally killed. At the time, Victor was just a seven-year-old child. Although his time with his mother was brief, from his perspective, he could consider the town his home. Following closely behind, Tabitha found a dumbfounded Victor and asked why he had hidden the matter of the cave symbols from Jade. Victor felt that there was no way out for this town, and any exploration would only lead to worse consequences. Because his mother had warned him the night she left that as soon as she finished this task, they could go home. But the next day, all the town's residents were murdered. Tabitha then asked what his mother had gone to do. Victor said he couldn't remember. Tabitha felt disappointed, but to her surprise, Victor added that he had a habit of drawing to prevent himself from forgetting important things. He then took Tabitha to where his mother's car was parked. 
Over the years, Victor had been recording important memories in his drawings, but was afraid to revisit them, so he kept them all in the trunk of his mother's car. The moment he saw them, Victor became excited. He finally remembered that he had a little sister, but after their mother left, his sister, out of fear, followed suit. Victor didn't stop her at the time, and thus he lost his sister forever. This was an immensely painful memory for Victor, so he tried to forget it and hid the drawings in this remote place. After calming Victor, Tabitha began to flip through the other drawings. Among them, a stone tower was peculiar. Victor suddenly recalled that on the night his mother left, she had gone to this stone tower, saying she was going to rescue trapped children. As nightfall approached, Randall found Donna with a sincere expression, admitting that his previous actions had been too impulsive. He hoped that everyone could go inside the house and talk things out calmly. Not long after, the two sheriffs returned to the town after burning the bodies. They once again heard the familiar buzzing of the flies. Suddenly, a man covered in blood ran out from a room, wailing for help. Meanwhile, when Jim arrived near the trailer as planned, he was shocked to see Donna tied to a large tree, with a menacing Randall standing beside her. The scene shifts to a resident running out of his house in a panic, yelling for help. The passing Boyd followed him inside and was taken aback to see a mutilated corpse lying in the bed. The man explained that his wife had been muttering the same phrase over and over again while she was napping, before screaming that the demons were out. Then her stomach and mouth burst open. Boyd, in disbelief, asked what the repeated dream phrase was. The man murmured, they're coming unless you stop. Kenny was astonished by that. He had heard the same phrase before, in a voice on the phone while he was dreaming the previous night. Boyd knew he was dealing with a serious situation. Two residents had already been injured in their dreams, and now someone had actually been killed and died in their sleep. He had to do something to prevent further tragedies. Boyd instructed Julie to go door to door, telling residents not to sleep that night. Thinking of Sarah in the church, Kenny offered to go and look after her. At this point, Julie remembered that her father had gone to a trailer in the wilderness and was not aware of the dangers of dreaming. Meanwhile, Jim was in a state of shock. He couldn't believe that Randall was intending to offer Donna to a demon. Even though Randall explained that this was just a test for Donna, Jim still thought it was insane. If Donna was innocent, they would be senselessly killing a good person. Jim decided to free her. However, Randall knocked him over and drew a dagger, threatening him not to disrupt the plan. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out. It's Boyd who had arrived. He had originally come to tell Jim not to sleep at night, but had not expected to walk into such a drama. With nightfall approaching, Boyd just wanted to take everyone back to town as quickly as possible. But Randall took out the car keys and threw them into the forest. Now no one could go back. Randall shrugged indifferently, suggesting they all stay overnight together. Julie, waiting at the front door of her home, saw no sign of her father returning. Instead, she spotted Jade and Victor, who announced their intention to spend the night. They had important matters to discuss, primarily concerning the peculiar illustrations Victor had brought along. Kenny took Sarah to the police station by himself. Even though he harbored resentment towards her as his father's murderer, his duty as a police officer was to ensure the town's safety. After spending days consumed by wild thoughts, Sarah developed a new perspective on the town. She believed that it was endlessly creating fear, swallowing it up to become a part of itself. Her brother had been terrified of cicadas since childhood. Now that he was gone, would these nightmare-like cicadas become another source of the town's fear? As though to confirm her words, the sound of the cicadas outside the window became more frantic as night fell. Meanwhile, the inhabitants of the colony house learned about the dream murders from the man who just lost his wife. The people seemed a bit flustered and uneasy. Since Donna was absent, a woman took on the responsibility, urging everyone not to sleep that night and arranging accommodations for the newcomers. On the other side, Boyd and a few others had settled in a motorhome. According to custom, amulets to ward off demons were indispensable. Jim only just learned about the dream murders, and his only wish was to return to his family. He thought he could try to start a vehicle outside using jumper cables, but Boyd immediately refused. It was dark outside, not a time for taking risks. Randall, however, continued to push his luck, suggesting that even Boyd could be a traitor. Boyd was so furious that he nearly threw Randall out of the motorhome. After finally calming Randall down, Boyd began to smear bullets with demon bile. Suddenly, Donna suggested that confronting the demons was too dangerous, and why not let Randall take the risk? After all, he wanted to uncover the truth. Boyd thought it made sense and offered Randall a gun, asking if he wanted to give it a try. The rustling sound of footsteps outside the motorhome signaled that the demons had finally appeared. Randall hesitated for a while before agreeing to try, but Donna suddenly let out a startled cry. There was something odd about these demons because they had stopped a short distance away. 
In the past, they would surely have come closer, tempting everyone to open the door. Just then, a familiar music box melody echoed within the RV, but the sound was coming from the radio, which had long since been broken. Boyd panicked. He knew every time this tune played, something bad would happen. Suddenly, a thumping noise came from beneath the floor, as if something was trying to burrow its way in. Randall was so tense he smashed the RV window with a hammer. Following suit, Boyd kicked down the glass door. They couldn't stay in the vehicle any longer. As the demon steadily approached, Boyd hastily fired his gun, but the bullets, coated with bile, had little effect. Jim seized the opportunity to start up a car nearby. Suddenly, Boyd heard someone calling out. It was his wife who had been dead for a long time. He knew this was just an illusion and immediately turned to join Jim. Poor Randall, however, plunged into the depths of the forest. Suddenly, the urgent chirping of cicadas filled the air. The next moment, countless flying cicadas pounced on him. Meanwhile, in the colony house where they sought refuge, Dr. Christie and his girlfriend Mari had been assigned to Ellis's room for the night. Seeing the belt on the bed, Mari couldn't resist making a joke that they really knew how to have a good time. Ellis was embarrassed and explained to Christy that the belt on the bed wasn't for some strange hobby, but because Fatima was pregnant. In this eerie town, any strange thing could happen. He had to prepare for the worst. What if she gave birth to a monster with sharp teeth and claws? Christy tried to calm his wild thoughts. Pregnancy should be a wonderful thing. But when she returned to the room, she found Mari screaming in panic. She felt there was something terrifying lurking around. Christy kept soothing her. Though Mari was no longer scared, she grew angry. Her predicament was all because of Christy's sudden disappearance. Christy did her best to comfort her irritable girlfriend. Once Mari calmed down, she recognized her abnormal state and suggested Christy use the belt to tie her up, just in case she exhibited any extreme behaviors again. Suddenly, the bell downstairs rang loudly. The man who had lost his wife was also becoming agitated. The other residents thought he had gone mad. Only Fatima kept reassuring them that they were safe here. Elgin forcefully took him upstairs. After finally settling the issue, an old lady nearby praised Fatima and Elgin for handling the situation well. But when she learned that Fatima was pregnant, Elgin seemed to remember something. Suddenly, lights shone from outside the window. Donna was back in her car. Meanwhile, Christy was still caring for Mari. As she stepped out to fetch hot water, Mari grew terrified. She heard the ear-piercing chirping of cicadas and then was attacked by a swarm of flying cicadas. When Christy returned to the room, she found Mari struggling on the bed. She had never encountered such a strange event and watched helplessly as Mari's breathing grew fainter. At this point, Boyd and a few others had safely returned to the colony house. They had barely settled when they heard a commotion upstairs. Rushing up, they discovered Mari's eyes bulging and turning pale. It was clear she was not far from death. Christy was on the verge of collapse, unable to bear this cruel blow. Just then, Ellis raced in, announcing that Elgin had recalled some content about dreams. He spoke of a little boy in white who kept repeating the sentence, They're coming unless you stop. A woman found the words familiar and remembered them as an old nursery rhyme. Boyd was bewildered, clueless about what these frequently appearing lyrics truly meant. On the other side, Sarah was in the police station and seemed a little off. Sensing Kenny's indifferent attitude towards her, she knew he was still nursing a grudge against his father's murder. So she again started her repentance mode. Kenny, who had been holding back his anger, could no longer contain it and asked her to take the spare gun from the drawer and do whatever she wanted with it. But when Sarah pulled out the gun, Kenny felt some regret. He worried that Sarah might be desperate enough to end her own life. Fortunately, she wasn't so obstinate and decided to play a game of Russian roulette, leaving her fate to destiny. After placing two bullets in the cylinder, she pulled the trigger twice in succession, but no bullet was fired. Kenny then snatched the gun from her, letting out a sigh of relief. On the other side, Tabitha was discussing strange images with Jade, who was amazed that all these things were drawn by children. She pulled him back and reminded him to ponder the meaning of the painting. She wondered why Victor's mom said that everyone could leave the town once the child trapped in the tower was rescued. Recalling the strange, pale children she had seen before, Tabitha wondered if they were not malicious, but seeking help from them. Just then, a horrifying scream came from the living room next door. It turned out that Julie was rolling on the floor, as if fending off terrifying cicadas on her body. Boyd, accompanied by Kenny and Sarah, ventures deep into the forest. Recently, a nursery rhyme has been recurring in many people's dreams. Curiously, Julie, Mari, and Randall are the ones who have recently fallen into distress. Could there be a connection?
As they converse, they quickly arrive at a ruin, the same place where Boyd previously encountered the old man in the wall. He believes that the recent bizarre incidents all originated from a music box found there. At that moment, Sarah hears the melody emitted by the music box. Boyd invited Sarah this time because she had previously communicated with unknown entities. Once again, she hears a warning from them. A terrifying force is about to take three people and all the town's residents will die. The only way to save them is to stop the music box and save the three lives. This bears some similarity to the lyrics of the nursery rhyme, only it's more explicit. Elgin once mentioned that he heard the nursery rhyme from a little boy in white in his dream. It seems that this might be their way of warning the town's residents about the impending crisis. Even so, Boyd is clueless about his next move. He can't connect the dots of the information pieces and doesn't even have a clue where the music box is. Meanwhile, Donna looked at the people who had stayed awake all night with a sense of despair. If they couldn't solve the problem of the dreams killing people, everyone would eventually suffer a mental breakdown. She reminded the guard to put the gun back in the warehouse, thinking it might never be needed again. However, little did they know the poor man whose wife had died tragically in a dream was following them. He took out a knife, killed the guard, and retrieved the long gun from the cabinet. On the other side, Jade hadn't given up on finding a way to save people's lives. His method was a bit unconventional, though. He smashed the wine bottles in the bar, hoping to find the hidden truth behind the strange patterns from a different perspective. At some point, the deceased bar owner suddenly appeared behind him. Jade was unfazed by this, guessing it was a mental illness caused by stress. The bar owner suggested Jade explore the demon cave because Tabitha had once said that the same pattern symbols had also appeared there. However, going there was practically a death journey. The bar owner suddenly brought up his own death experience. When he rushed into the crumbling house, all he wanted to do was save people. Even knowing it would lead to his death, he never regretted it. Jade was touched by his story. For the sake of the whole town, it was worth taking the risk. Not long after, Jade found a thin rope and fixed one end to a large tree. He then took the remaining rope and went into the demon cave. The path inside was winding and rugged. This was the only way he could prevent getting lost. Suddenly, a shadow appeared not far away. Jade was startled, and on approaching, he realized it was a human-shaped doll. When he continued and reached a vast area, he suddenly heard a strange noise. Looking around, he saw seven children with pale faces lying in different positions. Jade looked up in shock. The vines at the entrance of the cave formed the strange symbols he knew well. When Jade came back to his senses, he found that the seven children had disappeared. It was as if he had just experienced a dream. On the other side, Tabitha was also working diligently to save her daughter, Julie. She remembered something Victor once mentioned. His mother had tried to rescue some children from a stone tower, promising that everyone would be able to return home. Tabitha decided to visit the stone tower, hoping there might be a way to cure her daughter. But Jim was utterly against the idea because it was dangerous, and Victor's mother never returned after she went to that stone tower. However, in her near despair, Tabitha was ready to make sacrifices for her daughter's safety. She took Victor aside to ask for the exact location of the stone tower. Victor thought for a moment and then drew out a picture, on which was a large tree hung with glass bottles. He told her that if she found this tree, she could reach the tower. Jim seemed to have a premonition of what was to come, holding his wife and refusing to let go. Before long, guided by Victor, Tabitha ventured deeper into the forest. They successfully found the legendary bottle tree. Victor revealed that it was here he found his mother's body. In the back of the tree was a large hole. Tabitha had heard that these tree holes can teleport people to different places randomly, but Victor clarified that this particular tree hole was an exception. It could only transport people to one specific location. Tabitha understood that the place Victor referred to was the Stone Tower. Victor offered her a tin box filled with various dry foods. Tabitha expressed her sincere thanks, and without hesitation she crawled into the tree hole. In the blink of an eye, she arrived at a strange jungle. A tall wooden door came into view. Tabitha looked up, only to find this was the stone tower Victor had spoken about. While they were close to uncovering the truth about the town, the condition of Julie and others was getting worse. The mental stress on Boyd was immense. He couldn't think of a way to find the music box, so he resorted to speaking to himself in the church, hoping the deceased priest would appear and inspire him. Unfortunately, it wasn't the priest who arrived, but Donna from the colony house. 
Boyd told her that if they couldn't save Julie and the others, the entire town would be buried with them. Donna was grateful for Boyd's contribution to the town, but she thought if the end of the world was indeed coming, why not attend Ellis and Fatima's wedding first? After all, there was nothing they could change. Boyd thought this made sense. He had neglected his son too much, even ignoring his big life events, so he appeared as the witness at his son's wedding. During the ceremony, Ellis confessed his love to Fatima was like a light in the dark, illuminating his path. The bride was utterly moved, and behind them, Boyd seemed to have a revelation. He murmured about the light in the dark, as if he had thought of something. He quickly bid his son goodbye and rushed to Victor's trailer to fetch a torch, which was taken from the wall when he left the strange old man's place. Suddenly, a voice of reproach came from behind. It was the pitiful man who was already on the verge of breakdown. He believed all the misfortune, including his wife's tragic death, was caused by Boyd. He pulled the trigger in his hand, but Boyd, enduring the pain, fired back and quickly killed the poor man. Fortunately, the bullet had not hit a vital part of his body. Afterward, Boyd once again found himself in the ancient ruins. The moment he ignited the torch in his hand, he was instantly transported back to the demon's lair. However, the figures bound to the wall were not the strange old men, but Julie, Mari, and Randall. The music box was indeed still in the corner of the wall. As Boyd prepared to smash it, a voice stopped him. To his surprise, it was his wife Abby, who had been dead for many years. She told him that destroying the music box would only prolong everyone's pain. Just as she finished speaking, Julie and the others began to scream like chickens. The entities in the town also joined the chorus of shrieks. Boyd realized the woman before him was a demon in the guise of his wife. Abby hastily explained that none of this mattered. She only wanted to tell Boyd that the source of the demon's power was not fear, but hope. The residents' repeated hopeful explorations of the town were precisely what allowed the evil power behind them to grow and evolve into the ability to kill in dreams. Boyd was so desperate to this revelation, but the only thing he could do now was to smash the music box in front of him. As a result, Julie and the others, who had been deathly ill, suddenly returned to normal. Even Randall, who was the most injured, also recovered with his pupils returning to their natural colors. Boyd looked around and realized he had returned to reality. Everything he had seen before was like a dream, or more like a hidden demon space. Suddenly, the familiar dog appeared again. After a few barks, it ran towards the distance. Boyd wanted to follow the dog, but hesitated because every time he did this before, something bad would happen. After waking up, Julie looked around her bedroom and discovered that her mother was gone. Jim and his son silently looked into the distance. Meanwhile, Tabitha was still climbing the towering stone tower. The toys scattered on the ground indicated that the pale children had indeed been held here. The top of the tower was equipped with a gear mechanism, causing the lights above to sway. Tabitha was really curious about what these things were for. Suddenly, a little boy in white appeared out of nowhere, saying this was the only way before pushing Tabitha off the tower. When she woke up again, she found herself in a modern hospital. Mari said that Tabitha was found in the forest three days ago. She hastily opened the window, and the skyscrapers came into view. She couldn't believe she had actually escaped from the nightmare town. Previously, Boyd's ventures outside the town several times narrowly missed the truth about the town. The reason their outcomes were different might be because Boyd at that time was driven by hope, while Tabitha's actions were driven by a despair so deep she wished to sacrifice her life to end it all. This precisely corroborates the premise that the smiling demons can hunt and absorb people's hope to become stronger and reap lives in their dreams. However, it's people like Tabitha, filled with despair, that leave the demon in the legends powerless. In the end, she was able to break free from this eerie town. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.